joining us for this uh, one hour webinar that we're hosting um, in response to Hurricane Helene and those of you who are out in the field looking to do some home repairs for our residents here that have been impacted by the hurricane. I am very grateful that you've chosen to spend your time with us. We are recording this if anyone's asking so that we will be able to share this later. Um, you can share that. You feel free to share with others that you might know as well. Um, and so uh, my name is Erin Johnson. I'm with Central Carolina Community Foundation, and we house the state's 1SC fund um, here at the Community Foundation. Uh, today's webinar, just so we all know we're here for the right reason, is Housing Repair Resources for Hurricane Helene Recovery um, in partnership with Central Carolina Community Foundation, the South Carolina Office of Resilience, and Habitat for Humanity of South Carolina. Um, our goal today in the, in the hour we have together is to really be able to provide you all some some information to help increase collaboration. This is really what we're trying to lean into very heavily here. We can't do this on our own. None of us can. Increase collaboration between our nonprofit organizations, our state, um, as well as VOAS, Volunteer Organizations Active in Disaster, um, to increase efficiency and decrease duplication in our efforts to really be able to spread our resources as far and wide as possible. We also want to talk to give you, some of you are going to be introduced and you aren't maybe familiar with some of the work that our state is doing as well, but introduce you to the role and primary tasks of our Office of Resilience um, during um, Hurricane Helene and, and actually during other times as well, but specific to this disaster. We're also going to talk a little bit about the role that you all as nonprofits can be playing and our VOADs during this Hurricane Helene response. Um, and then to talk through what we think could be a really great partnership and increase our efficiency um, on how we can work together with SCORE as nonprofits. And then I'll also end it with a little bit of un understanding about the 1SC fund, and there are other funds that are out there as well. We'll talk a little bit about the 1SC fund on how you can access resources moving forward. So that's our goal in the hour we have together. I will encourage you to ask questions through chat. Uh, we'll, we have you all muted, but we encourage you to ask questions through chat. And then at the end, if we have time, hopefully we can unmute ourselves and ask any questions that might be for the greater good for the whole group to be able to answer. So I introduced myself already. I'm Erin Johnson again, but I'll let my folks, my friends here introduce themselves. Thanks, Hi guys, I'm Nancy Lee. I'm the executive director for Habitat for Humanity South Carolina. Uh, it's a state organization. We support 24 local affiliates and communities all across the state. I'm Rand Reinhardt, director of operations for the South Carolina Office of Resilience. Um, we do a bunch of things, but one of them is disaster recovery long-term. Great, so what we're gonna do now is kind of get into, just so we're all level setting, uh, we've asked Rand if he could give an overview of just really the state of, of things right now um, around our counties and give us a little update on that. All right, so as you know, uh, Hurricane Helene uh, hit the basically the Western side of South Carolina. It uh, uh, did probably some historical damage. We're, we're looking at uh, things that are bigger than Hugo was back in 89, there are 29, uh, FEMA individual assistance declared counties, uh, 28 counties plus the Indian uh, Catawba Nation as well. So 29 entities there. We have over 376,000 IA applicants. But to put that in context, um, if you added the 2015 Hurricane Joaquin, thousand year flood, 2016 Hurricane Matthew, and 2018 Hurricane Florence, the total IA count was about 170. So we're already uh, over 200,000 more individual applicant citizens in the day we applying to FEMA days. than we had in all the combined disasters uh, we've had in this the last three. Um, there's over 6,351 homes that have been damaged. We know that 380 are destroyed. There's approximately 2,100 that are major damage and about 2,300 plus that are minor damage. And that's just what we know so far. FEMA is still out doing the assessments, so those numbers could go up. Um, this is my third disaster here in South Carolina, and this is by far the biggest and most, most complex. Um, you know, Greenville and Aiken, if you look at number-wise, took it really bad. Uh, but you gotta remember, they're rather robust population counties. Even though some counties took smaller numbers total, it is a greater percentage of impact on their their population size. Um, so, you know, I deal with federal funding predominantly. I've got some state funding that we're going to deploy, uh, but federal funding is always the thing people ask about. So, FEMA is currently on on site. Uh, they've got disaster recovery centers. They've got some disaster survivor assistance. And let me just say. 
anybody that's been impacted, please encourage them to go and register with FEMA. Even if they get denied, um, numbers do count. And they do help what our percentage of the disaster appropriation Congress will make at some point um, will help South Carolina get more money. Plus, if you don't apply, you have no chance of getting any funding. Now, that funding that they're going to give you is going to come in the way of individual assistance. It could come for replacing stuff in your home, perhaps. Um, if you're eligible, it's repairing your home. The maximum amount you're going to get is $42,500 if your home is destroyed. No one is replacing their home with forty two thousand five hundred. Uh, that's just it, it's just never enough. And, and like we always say, I get this much disaster, but I have this much money. Uh, so FEMA is right now on site. SBA, the Small Business Administration, has loans that are available too. Those are very low interest loans, but it is a loan. You do have to pay it back. Um, Department of Agriculture also has some opportunities as well. And the Small Business Administration loans, nonprofits are eligible for those, correct? They, they are. Okay. Uh, but individuals also are. Okay. Um, I'm kind of geared towards the individual. I didn't think about that. Um, now, HUD, which is the, the big uh, recovery dollars for housing and infrastructure stuff, uh, will come along later. It, unfortunately, uh, I, I really got to thank nonprofits. You guys are the, 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 the on the site right after the disaster, making it happen, helping people. We're like a battleship. It, it just we are just slow to get out of the, away from the dock. Uh, but once we get out there, we we can bring a lot. We bring a lot of money and a lot of capacity. But it just takes us time. Right now, uh, the Congress has not appropriated money for the 2023 disasters. Uh, they come back into session in December, so that's the earliest they can appropriate money. Probably uh, when, once they do that, HUD will have to allocate it between all the people, including the island of Maui that had wildfires in 23, plus all the people that have had disasters, including Florida's had three now in 24, mm -hmm. all those people. So South Carolina will get a piece of that pie. Once we get that allocation, South Carolina, uh, South Carolina Office of Resilience will be as fast as we possibly can. We've done a lot of things leaning forward uh, to, to set ourselves up so that we can start building houses. But my best guess would be you won't see HUD dollars appearing on the battlefield to build houses until probably June or July. Now, it could be sooner. I'd love for them to surprise me. They have before. But typically in our three disasters, 15, 16, 18, it takes about nine months after the disaster for the money on average to get there. Uh, I know that's not what people want to hear. <laughs> They'd love to hear, yeah, your government's really fast. But that's not. I, I'm not going to give you a, a, an unreasonable expectation. But they're doing a great job. Doing a great job. Yeah. But we're not. It's a slow moving ship. Yeah, yes. it just doesn't. It, it, you know, you, it takes a little bit to get rolling. I mean, we're kind of like a train. It just. Um, so. Um, in the meantime, if you do have homeowners insurance, that's the probably your first route. FEMA is probably your second route. Um, then, you know, FEMA is going to give you money for your for your house if there's damage or it fits in the category. And FEMA does have a lot of categories. They can do a lot of things like there's there's money for funeral. Um, and stuff like that. I don't even know all the categories. It's pretty amazing. But if you get money for your house, use it for your house. Uh, because later on, when I come to try to help you, if you didn't use it on your house, it's a duplication of benefit, and I have to take that amount out of what the service I can provide you. Um, because I can't duplicate federal dollars. If you get money, you get $5,000 to fix your roof, please fix your roof. Uh, because if, if when I come, that's five thousand dollars on off the service I can provide you that I'm going to have to uh, not give you. Um, my agency, which is probably one of the newer agencies in the state, we used to be a temporary agency called the South Carolina Disaster Recovery Office. Um, we do a lot of things besides disaster recovery, but that's kind of the key thing right now. Uh, we focus uh, on the most vulnerable socially uh, because they're the they're the least likely to run away from a disaster, so they're also the least likely to recover from a disaster. And so we're very LMI focused in our three disasters of the, I don't know, 3,500 homes we've replaced or repaired, I think 99.9%, .9%, if not 100%, have all been low to moderate income. And in most cases, we never got past uh, an individual who was 50% or less of their area median income for their county. So these are our most vulnerable socially citizens are demographically, it's a 
African American female that's over 65 years old who lives on Social Security or disability. And she can choose money and food, or I can repair my house, which isn't much of a choice. Um, we like to partner with a lot of state agencies um, through like the uh, recovery support function 14, which is long term housing. So, like SE Housing, uh, EMD, other. Uh, other agencies that deal with housing to try to solve some of the problems, both in the short term, but also looking at the long term. And this is this is really a bit uh, tricky because there's not a lot of excess housing laying around South Carolina, especially if it's affordable housing. Um, so we're partnering with agencies. We're also partnering with our uh, VOAD partners because they're so much quicker uh, to get to the battlefield. And uh, so look, I, just from my boss, Look, go build houses, go repair houses for us. We'll eventually show up, but you guys got to carry the fight for us right now. Um, I've got disaster case managers, which is is um, a trademark of our um, our agency and our state. They are out there. You, if you've been to a DRC, you probably may have run into one of them. Disaster yeah. Recovery Center. Disaster Recovery Center. <laughs> I'm sorry, I used an ugly acronym. Uh, disaster case managers are at the, uh, the SC team days we've had. Uh, we will, in time, in the next coming like 30 to 60 days, we'll be uh, establishing static sites in four of the regions uh, that have been impacted. Excuse me. We'll start to do probably at the 60 to 90 day mark or so, we'll start to do mobile intakes. And we're, we're bringing you into uh, our, which will be the long-term disaster recovery program. But we'll also be bringing you, if you have a home destroyed, into our rapid rebuild program, but we're going to share, if we can't serve you, we will share with our volunteer uh, organization partners because they may be able to serve you in some cases. And we wanna make sure that we can serve as many, I, look, if, if I can't serve them, if somebody serves them, that's what we really care about. Um, one of the things that the challenges that I see uh, that that we're gonna work with our partners to, to solve is, how do I know what you're doing, what the volunteer agencies are doing over here and over here so that I don't duplicate effort? Um, haven't had a great um, track record in the past of doing that in an organized manner. We have done it successfully in some haphazard patched together methods um, that worked, but you know, we need to have something more organized. So that's something we'll be asking you guys to help us to figure out. We'd like to have a common operating picture so we, we know where all the people have been impacted who have housing issues are, and then making sure people are able to, to handle, to go help them based on what they can do. Not everybody can do a total rebuild of a house, but they can do a lot of repair. Uh, so you've got a house that needs some repair. Let's match that person to that, that volunteer agency's capability and let's let's just repair houses and i have probably talked way too much now that was i think very helpful and just so everyone knows chantrell mitchell does she is on staff here at central carolina community foundation she's dropping some information in the chat as we talk if you have any questions uh specifically to some of the things that Rand just mentioned please do drop that in the chat we'll try to make sure we can get to that um and then what we'll do now is kind of shift over a little bit to nancy to talk a little bit about Really, um, they've done some of this work before. Um, definitely, her groups have done this out in the PD in the Low Country. Uh, a little bit about our VOADs. Talk about what that is. If you're maybe you're already on one, but also really the role of nonprofits. Um, yes. So Habitat is typically more of a long-term recovery partner. So when we really when we start looking at when those federal dollars come in, how can we assist? How can we truly help re rebuild? Uh, we are not an emergency crisis responders. So this is us coming in this early is unique for our, for our network. Um, like so many folks on, on this webinar, we have we our teams deployed quickly to assess homes, certainly with our Habitat partner families, neighborhoods that we had built or repaired in previously, looking to see how what our staff needed, what our volunteers needed, were there things within the community that we could partner with our restore to do donation drives. Um, connect resources, whether they were tarps or water, or um, in some cases, generators, um, power sources, et cetera. So we deploy quickly like that, but we've really been cautious to say, hey, we are not a crisis emergency uh, repair partner. 
That said, um, this is such a unique weather event that impacted you know, half the state, um, more than half the state, that we look, stepped back to say, hey, how can we talk to some of our partners? You know, We sit on these state level calls and with these groups with our state level VOAD partners, with long-term recovery groups, with the housing uh, RSF, the recovery support function, um, some emergency support functions. We are there for situations like this to say, hey, when there are opportunities to mobilize quickly, there's a need there. Um, what would be needed from our side? How, what, where could we assist? Understanding this is a huge puzzle piece, you know, a huge puzzle. What is our small piece right now? How can we assist and do it in a very methodical, intentional, and responsible way that manages expectations within the community, um, within our Habitat affiliates, and really helps move the ball forward to say, if there's, you know, 6,300 impacted homes, what can Habitat do right now to stabilize some of those that were majorly affected? But if they're, you know, they had some roof, roof damage, they had some impacts that if they are not addressed in a, a timely fashion, then that very quickly in six months will become a much larger issue, much more expensive, much more time consuming. And that, you know, really uh, impacts that 6,300, you know, number that we're talking about now. Um, and it's really impactful on that, on that family. So what can Habitat do recognizing our roles in the long term, typically? What can we do right now in that shorter term? And, and what does that look like? Um, because this is something that nobody really expected. It's, you know, we have, for Habitat's perspective, we have here are homes that we are building, we're repairing um, community commitments that we already have in place. So when we sat down with our teams, we said this would have to be a parallel track, that we have to continue doing that. So how can we ramp up with the capacity that we have in place? What can we do in order to mobilize quickly and assist with some of these, you know, smaller repairs, more minor repairs? And for our purpose, we're defining minor as, uh, you know, somewhere around the $10,000 range. Uh, we don't feel like if we if we kind of limit to that, then we aren't, it is very unlikely that we're gonna go assess a property and come across a situation where it's more likely gonna be destroyed than, you know, be a rebuild situation. So trying to, again, take some of that low hanging fruit and address it before it becomes more problematic. So Habitat has a great network. While each of our affiliates are unique individual 501c3s, we all operate under the Habitat brand. We all have um, shared data. We all have shared uh, requirements, criteria, expectations. So we're able to work together very easily. Um, and, 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 you know, we sat down, there was a, several groups that sat down and had a kind of a powwow, I think it was last week, and said, what can everybody bring to the table? For us, it was, hey, we have we can have our site construction site managers go out and assess properties, do scopes of work. We can partner with contractors to quickly uh, repair these homes. But our our hang up really was that that family services, that front side capacity of of eligibility screening, if you will. So we are um, speaking with Office of Resilience on on that piece to where we would partner with them and this is evolving so you know right now it's going to look one way in a month it'll look another and 90 days so it, it'll it'll continue to get you know more built out so what i, I want to make bring it real clear what nancy's so we've kind of shifted into um a, a, a possible structure that all of our nonprofits actually that are receiving funding from from whoever to be able to do some of this um housing repair work this is a structure so we as, as nancy mentioned met last week and thanks to office of resilience for sort of kicking this off to say, we think we might have a plan for how we can all sort of work together um, to be more um, cohesive and, you know, also our, all, you know, we're not kind of stepping on each other's toes and also re, uh, decrease the amount of work that some of our nonprofits maybe have to do on the front end and I'll be more collaborative. So, so thank you very much. So now Nancy's going to kind of describe a little bit and she and Rand will think, talk through what this kind of proposed structure could look like that you all could also follow if, if you're so inclined. Perfect. Thank you. Yes. So um, in this particular situation, we don't have a physical office or presence in all of the 28 impacted counties. I think we cover, when I counted, I think it's technically 16 counties, and we currently don't offer owner-occupied home repairs in all of those. Um, certainly we have contractors, we have a structure in place, we have other affiliate partners that we can, that can assist each other, but how can if we if we look at a map of the counties that are impacted there are a lot of rural areas that we don't currently have in this part of the state that we don't currently have a footprint in so there's also the side of we don't have even if we want it to move quickly if we had a ton of funding we how do we how do we address those um without having existing relationships a, a existing bandwidth there 
So the structure really comes in to say, hey, you know, if, if everyone, if, if the community in general is pushing folks to go um, to reach out to the Office of Resilience, to go to a, a disaster recovery center, to, to apply, to seek funding, to say, hey, I need assistance in whatever capacity it is, if that's kind of the centralized hub for where the information is going, then Habitat can partner with the Office of Resilience to say, hey, here's the information that we need. So when they're doing their intake, when they're doing the pre-screening, for us to have a data sharing agreement, for us to have a partnership in place that says, you're gonna help us on that side so that we can say, hey, here's our capacity at X time, and we can assist five homes in, in this part of Greenville County or six homes in this part of Aiken County, the data will then come from them. So the addresses, the name, the needs, it will come from them. So we aren't having to go out and create a whole new program from scratch. Um, and likewise, it's also really great, I think, I think it's going to be for the households as well, because they're not having to duplicate their efforts and say, hey, I already filled all this stuff out, or where did I put it, or why am I doing this again? So I think it's 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 very, it's, it's going to be focused on the individual household that were impacted as well. So we're, we're excited about that. But it essentially, the names, the addresses would come, and I'm simplifying this, but the names, the addresses would come from the Office of Resilience to Habitat. Habitat, then our teams would go out and do um, some more visual assessments, do the actual scope of work, the list out, you know, what's the agreed upon um, repairs that need to occur, limited, and again, more expectation management here, limited to Helene. So what, yes. what, what repairs uh, were caused by Helene that are needed to make sure the house is going to stay safe, dry, sanitary, stable? Um, again, we, we don't want this to become a, a bigger problem, but really focused in on, you know, when we go into property, there might be more needs there, but really what is our role at this moment within this mission? Um, all this is funding dependent, but it, the concept is that if we receive funding from entities, um, then you're able to, we, we say, hey, we have the names and addresses, we have the funding to do it. We can either mobilize our existing uh, construction supervisors and volunteers, or in a lot of cases, really to move quickly, probably some of our trusted contractors is what we're for the most part looking at to go in and make and do these repairs. And then we can report back to Office of Resilience. So it's a full comprehensive look for that household. We're able to track the numbers. They're able to see that, hey, this household reached out. Maybe they had feeding needs and utilities, um, transportation. There were multiple things that occurred. Housing was one of them. So this part of their need was met because that's what Habitat could contribute to. And it lets them know that, but it also lets them know here are the other things that Habitat previously just like, you know, here's a couple of resources maybe for you to try. It still keeps them in that full comprehensive case management um, criteria. So for us, that's a way to, to mobilize quickly. It also, again, manages expectations in the community. So, you know, for all of us nonprofits, funding is limited, especially right now on the front side before a lot of those federal dollars come in. Um, realistically, we while we would love to be able to, you know, assist all of these homes, for us to start up a program and say, hey, not only do we not have an office in a certain, you know, rural county, but hey, come apply to us. We recognize that folks need a lot of assistance. There's going to be a lot of folks raising their hands. Um, we would hate to do that and then only be able to help, you know, a small handful of them. So going about it this way, make sure that we're also managing the expectations um, from the community and then likewise not overextending ourselves with phone calls, with requests, um, with, with this additional need that, could potentially lead to mission creep. It's it's really we think a good structure in place, and it puts a good framework in place as well for that long term um, aspect when that comes you know later this summer and in the next year as well. So um, high level does that? Yeah, does that's that great. Right. And so, yeah, that just yes. Here. So um, yeah, the, the collaboration is key here. And look, like, like I said in the previous disasters, you guys have always carried the fight. Uh, you've been great partners. All the VOADs. Um, my disaster case managers, if you're if you're out there and you run into an individual that has, and maybe it's not a housing need, but has some unmet need that's disaster related, please send them to my disaster case managers. You can go to score.se.gov. Our phone numbers are on there. And the guys and gals that work in my disaster case management will go after those needs uh, just with some vigor. They're, they're just great people. And we have great partners in, in previous disasters. Harvest Hope has provided food baskets to homes. Food and Services provide furniture on occasions to, to, to clients. Um, so if you have somebody that has an issue, please, if it's not housing even, but if it's housing, you can send them to us. If it's, if it's a greater thing than you need, then let us. And look, this is kind of a phased operation. Right now, we're just cheer, score is cheerleading. That's, that's really all I can do right now. I can cheerlead. 
I'm gathering information. I'm gathering names. Clearinghouse. I, I'm in, in a way. Yeah. And I'm going to transition into a second phase where I can give you names of people that I know have damaged homes, but I don't know what the damage is. As I get FEMA data, I, I get more information from the clients. I'm going to be able to tell you more about that home, and I can give you a name if you want to come to me. It's not our. We're not going to get in your business. You go repair homes like you repair homes. You don't have to play by our rules. Now, when we get down the road and I have a HUD-funded community development block grant uh, to do disaster recovery, I will invite VOADs to come into our program. If you come into our program, you will have to follow our rules. Uh, for you know, and, it's, and, and they're not hard, but I will pay VOADs the same I pay regular general contractors. I know you'll make more profit than they will because you'll utilize free labor in some cases. We are absolutely okay with that because you'll go use that money to touch a house I can't touch. Like if a, if a house that's <laughs> on the border of the impacted area, but it's not named by HUD, but it got it got damaged, I can't touch it, but you could, uh, a VOAD could. So if you wanna be a part of that program, there'll be a time when we open up the gates and say, hey, VOADs, uh, and we've done this in all our disasters. If you wanna come work for us, really, uh, we'll give you the target, we'll give you the, the money, then, then we'll invite you to do that, but you don't have to. Um, and along with that, just one other thing, um, we will, in the past, we've always done our, our stakeholder meeting. We used to do it monthly. We've gone to quarterly because we thought, thought we were out of the disaster business, <laughs> uh, but I was wrong. So we're going to start probably next month. I, I think we'll start opening it up, going back to monthly. You are invited to attend physically at our headquarters, or you can join us online. How do they find out about those? Uh, if you write me <laughs> or you call the number, you call SCORE and you say, I want to be on that. I want to be on that mailing list because we'll send you the slides. We'll send you the information. Uh, if you previously were on it, we're going to we're going to send it to you. But if you like it and if you and oh, I really hate to do this, but if you go to RAN, R-A-N dot Reinhardt, R-E-I-N-H-A-R-D at SCORE, S-C-O-R dot S-C dot gov, email me. I'll make sure you're on the list. All right, we'll have to we'll have to get drop that in. Uh, so that's great. So let so I want to make sure that those of you who are maybe somewhat new to this, I want to be big picture to say what we're proposing as a possible um, structure and collaboration that would hopefully make it easy for all of us is that the Office of Resilience, you know, so our state does not yet have big federal money that's coming in. That's much later, but right now. The Office of Resilience is doing disaster case management and is collecting data on our residents who've been impacted by the hurricane. Um, they also, and we can talk about this here in a minute, are offering to start doing already home rebuilds. Now that's a slower process, but they are offering to take on any home at this point, not any homes that may need that. What we are saying is that this is an opportunity for nonprofits, especially before those big federal dollars come in, uh, we hope, uh, that the nonprofits can start doing repairs and they can access this list of homes that have already been pre-vetted, be able to say, here's a list of, of homes in your area where your service area is that do need, they've been vetted, they might have other needs as well, but you can come in and, and use that list to be able to start doing repairs. So that would help, we believe, a little bit, obviously reporting that back in the end to say, this is what we found and yes, it was done or not completed. Um, so that is the structure we're proposing. Yes. Okay. And, and you run across a house and it's outside your capability, send the information to me. Uh, we're going to go after, like you said, we're going to use some state dollars we've got. We're going to go after rebuilding the, uh, totally destroyed homes. That's going to be our, our initial target with state dollars until that federal grant goes. And then we'll do re we'll do repair and rebuilds across the spectrum. Okay. And it doesn't if it's an MHU uh, manufactured home, we do those too. So if you run across, a, you, you're out there, you're on the battlefield, you run across a house that's been destroyed, send it to us. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll try to go after it. Is that the correct email address? Ransford Reinhardt at score.se.gov? That one works. Okay. All right, good. Um, there was a question about apartments. What does that look like if, if apartments received damage? Uh, generally, we do not. We do not do apartments. We generally only do single family homes. We have done rental single family homes in the past. It has never been a very big program because, um, you know, just frankly, we are, we're kind of restricted. We don't want to reinforce slumlords. I mean, that's, that's probably the simplest way to say it. Um, 
we may expand it some uh, some more this year. We got to look at we got to look at kind of what the data says. There's always plenty of single family homes, but there are there's not a lot of affordable housing. So you know, doing multiple apartments uh, might be an option, but but the rental has never been. We've never had a big demand for it. Okay. Um, but just in in full transparency, we've done mainly most of our work on the east side. Most of the all three previous hurricanes have kind of hit the eastern coast of South Carolina. This west northwest corner, this is pretty much new territory for us. So we don't know, we don't have all the community contacts that we previously had. We, you know, if it's on the east side, we know all the places to go to do intake. This is fairly new for us. Um, and, you know, uh, we don't know, you know, where are all the big, you know, how many apartments are there and stuff like that. That's data that we're, we're still collecting. Uh, as FEMA does their uh, inspections, they'll tell us, is it an apartment? Is it a, is it a duplex? And we'll get that information, and then that will kind of build how much we want to open the the floodgate of rental dollars. But our our general focus is single family housing, and that would be the same for most of our nonprofits as well. Is that correct? Right. So for Habitat, we're staying within our mission of looking at eighty percent and below of the area median income, which aligns uh, with, with with scores target, and then on a regular basis we focus on uh, home ownership. So that's for us in the space that makes sense. Is it staying within our mission criteria? Um, just kind of expanding it out based on disaster impact. So, just one search up there. Um, airship property. Airs property. All okay. air property always, it, it, it derails a lot of grantees. We are not afraid of it. We have some great partners at SC uh, Legal Services, great partners uh, since, since 2015, and we're not afraid to tackle that issue. It does not scare us. That's good to know. And that's something that's as well for our nonprofits to think about with some of that. So, yeah. Is there, does anyone have any questions since, you know, we, uh, is there anything else y'all think would be helpful to share sort of about this sort of structure we, we discussed last week? I want to jump in on the heirs property um, issue just real quick and say from a nonprofit standpoint, um, this is to your point, it can be something, or whoever just said that can be something that's a little bit scary. One also additional benefit of working with the structure that we just laid out is that, you know, we went back and we asked, you know, officers resilience, we're familiar with their process of how they how they require what they require for proof of ownership and what that looks like. Um, because we were we were already discussing that with them prior to Helene. But with this, there's also that additional kind of comfort that those part of that pre-eligibility, once we get a little further down the line, will also include that. So for us, it's knowing that, hey, has this checked their standards, their box? Um, we recognize it's not as strict as um some other entities require, and we're okay with that. Because again, we're going into existing housing and making repairs on an existing structure that is already there. So it's it's you know very rare that you're gonna have somebody say, no, I, I'm not okay with somebody's roof being fixed. Um, but there's also that additional layer of comfort for us of knowing that, hey, we don't have to bring in an additional legal team to look at these items. Um, this additional expense where we don't have as much expertise, we can partner with agencies uh, and other nonprofit partners that do to ensure that we can still um, provide assistance to, to essentially to households that don't have just a clean title yeah. when that arises. Because we know that's something that's very significant that comes up a lot, particularly um, after weather disasters. Yes. So. yes. All right. So that was helpful. Does anyone have any questions? So one of my questions is, and I asked from this earlier, and so I'm going to ask it out loud again, which is, all right, so if our nonprofits here who have joined us say, okay, yes, I absolutely want to be part of this partnership and would love to tap into the resources, what do I do now? How do I do that? <laughs> yeah, well, we're building the plane. And I, I think what we're, not, what we're acknowledging here is that we're kind of building the plane as we're flying. Um, so, yes. Yeah, I mean, because this is, every disaster is a little different. This one is is, is bigger, um, and we're able to do a little more on the front end than usually. Generally, I, I wait and collect data, and then months down the road, then we get to go into action. It's the slow battleship. But contact us. Um, Come to that stakeholder meeting, whether you do it in person or virtual, that we'll, we'll have one, this is October, end of October, so it'll be in November. I think it's usually the fourth Thursday. Uh, I'll double check that, but contact us, get in on that. Uh, love to have you to the table uh, to discuss what you're seeing, because you're out in the communities and can tell us what you're seeing, um, just like anecdotally, at Clemson University, when we did the first Team days, all I heard from people was tree fell on my house, tree fell on my house, tree fell on my house. Um, 
Well, <laughs> that's a little trickier than just rebuilding the house. You got to remove the tree first. Um, but you guys are seeing what's out there, and and you guys maybe know individuals that are in an immediate need. That maybe you know people that uh, you know there. We know there's still like uh, people in shelters. Mm -hmm. uh, and that, that don't have an option of where how to go home and stuff. Those would be great targets if 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 somebody wants to tackle. You know, if, you, if I if I could if I could point it right there, I'd go to I'd go to find the county that's still got a shelter and got people in it, and I'd go find them. Matter of fact, I'm going to be sending my folks. I wrote that down. I'm going to send my folks to go find out who those folks are, and and that would be a great target to tackle it for at first. Great, thank you very much. All right, any other questions from anyone in the group? We have a nice group of folks here. Um, does anyone have any questions for us for now? All right. So what I want to make one, first of all, thank you all very much. I, I will say that I am uh, constantly impressed by our office of resilience staff. And I've gotten to know Nancy a lot better now with the folks from Habitat for Humanity. Um, they are very much client centered and they are really solution focused. And I love that. And I um, encourage us all to sort of kind of be like that um, and to really reach out and, and create partnerships as we can. Um, I do want to take a minute just to let you know a little bit about funding and then sort of some parting like what do we do now sort of thing. So as I mentioned before, we um, the Central Carolina Community Foundation does house the state's um, 1SC fund. Some of you are familiar with that. Some are not. Um, it started in 2015 after the historic flooding that we had here and has since responded to a few other hurricanes and then COVID-19 as well, actually. So we have made grants in every single South Carolina county at this point um, because of the COVID was our big when we really went statewide. Um, we've done over 10 million in grants, actually, and helped over um, 800,000 South Carolinians with basic needs, as well as repaired, help repaired over 2,300 homes. So. We have a little bit of history here, but this is the most streamlined, I think, and process that we've been able to really kind of um, identify and how this works. But the 1SC fund is accepting um, applications right now, as are many other um, philanthropic funds around the state. I encourage you, if you know um, foundations that are doing some of this work, reach out to them, let them know funding in this area, let them know that you're doing some of this work and you're interested in receiving grants. Um, there are multiple community foundations as well as private foundations that are out there funding in this space. Um, the 1SC fund, we are We've received some really gracious donations, um, and so we're ready to start granting. We already did our first grant to Feeding the Carolinas, and that hopefully has been filtering down. Hopefully, our, any of our food banks have started to see some of that, um, and so that's sort of come out. And then we are now, the application is open, and, and we'll be accepting applications on a rolling basis. Our committee will start reviewing those uh, at the beginning of November, so if you're able to, you know, you're interested, certainly... Um, you can apply for those dollars. Nancy's already kind of started the application and there may be, you know, and again, we take, we take um, feedback. If you're saying this question makes zero sense, please reach out to us or it's way too hard to gather this information, whatever it is you're looking for. Um, you can email us at uh, 1SCfund at yourfoundation.org and we're happy to help answer some of those questions. Uh, so again, what we're collect, what we're doing, we want to make sure that uh, these funds are used specifically for Hurricane Helene disaster response, right? I know sometimes it's easy. We say, well, people are always hungry, right? Well, we get that. And we, we certainly do, do our best with that. But we need to try to think through how can it be folks who are impacted by a disaster particularly. It does have to be for counties that do have an individual assistance disaster declaration. Um, and we, and the, the link was there for that earlier. Uh, and so that does is things like um, general home repair, obviously, which we just talked about. But there are also things around debris cleanup. Uh, food assistance, as we mentioned earlier, disaster case management. Some of your organizations do have disaster case managers. That is things we've helped fund in the past. Hopefully, you're also working in close collaboration with SCORE's disaster case managers, so we're collecting kind of similar information and sharing that information as appropriate, um, as well as health care that's not covered by insurance. That's something else that we can certainly talk through if you have a need and you've been able to vet some of that, uh, specific again to the hurricane. Um, and then, of course, home stabilization, tarping, those kind of things to prevent it from becoming an even bigger repair um, need in the end. And then eventually we'll get to maybe some of that if is needed furnishings or anything like that's inside the home that might have been damaged because of water or mud or anything like that. Then those are the kind of things as well that once we get there, those are things that can be funded. Um, and then for folks who are sheltering, who are, provi are not providing shelter for folks who are displaced, that is something they can apply for. Um, and then rent, mortgage, utility assistance. Maybe folks had to go without work for a couple of weeks and now it's they're getting behind. Some assistance for that is also things we could help uh, pay for. So I know a lot of your groups are doing not only home repairs, but all these other things as well. Or you know organizations that are embedded in these counties. 
Ideally, it's organizations that are already in county that are trusted by our communities because uh, they're more likely to open the, do open the door when you knock on it, right, and tell you really what's going on. And so we really want to be able to find uh, organizations that are that are there and trusted in within these communities. Um, and uh, again, it certainly is for our low to moderate income residents. Uh, and we typically, our grants are shorter term. So they're six months at best. Um, but if you get done with it sooner, you do your final report and you apply again, uh, is how we've sort of set it up. And we want to really make sure that you're applying for whatever your capacity, your typical capacity could be. We do have final reports, but there, and it will be, if, if someone gets funded, we will be asking you specific data around what's the county, what was the service provided, the number of people that received that service and how much you spend on it. So we can be able to provide that information back to our donors as well as to the state who's been a really great partner on this and has helped promote some of the work we've been doing. So wanna make sure just you understand that there has to be some basic capacity on grant management as well um, if you're receiving these dollars. So are there any questions in around some of that? You guys are a quiet group. All right, so what I have written down is like, what's the next step? I put on my nonprofit hat. What's the next step for me then right, as a nonprofit? Uh, one is that uh, I should probably contact SCORE and get make sure I'm on that stakeholder um, list. So I go to those stakeholder meetings, right? So I get that information so I can be involved in the whole collaborative effort. So I'm not sort of on an island out here, right? Kind of doing the work. I would also do some work to, de to really um, determine my own organization's capacity, what we can realistically do. I'll be honest, a lot of our grants in the past, a nonprofit would say, I can repair like two to four homes. Right, you know, and this, and that's realistic, and that's totally appropriate. So don't, you don't have to go. Whatever you can do is great. So be realistic about your own capacity as well as your service area. Um, is it realistic to think that you're, you and your volunteers and your staff are going to drive four counties over? Probably not, right? So really be realistic about your service area as well. So start thinking about that now. Um, and then, yeah, now, then you got to go secure some funding, right? After you've sort of figured that out, what can we do, and how and do we have the capacity to do it? secure that funding now, because it is going to take a little bit, right? Some of you have already gotten some quick grant, which is great. You can get started, but others, it might take two to three weeks before funds are really um, distributed. So really start doing that groundwork now so that you can, when money comes in in two or three weeks, you're ready to go. And then certainly if you have residents you come across, be referring them to the disaster recovery centers, disaster case managers, so they can get in the system because there's a lot of resources out there that they just have to be in that system to be able to access it and be referred to other stuff. So I have that as my to-do list. Is there anything else you guys think that has been is missing? Um, just a reminder, this is a team effort. Uh, look, you know, look, we'll get a bunch of HUD dollars, but but it's a team effort. It takes um, the volunteer agencies going out, uh, being the great partners that get to the battlefield quickly. It takes, you know, nonprofits. It takes uh, philanthropic sources uh, to make this happen. It takes, you know, government dollars, state people. But we we do this together. Can't do it without you. Uh, and, and it really it is a noble mission. Yeah. Just helping people who are on the you know a lot of times they're they're on the breaking point. And the one thing that we need to give them is hope. We need to give them hope that somebody is going to come and help them. Look, we're not going to get to everybody. I'm just I'm sorry. It's just an ugly reality. But we will get to we'll get to a lot of people together. We will put a lot of people back at homes. And and that there's. It's just a, it's a noble mission. It's why I get up and come to work. And you want, I can't follow that. I mean, I just want to <laughs> no, know, right? You know, I mean, that's, 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 you know, we're here. It is a team effort from, from Habitat side. I, I know there's a lot of folks on, on the call. We do participate in the stakeholder meetings. If you're interested in participating, please let me know. We'll get you connected. That way we're not, we're not completely over, overloading uh, RAND, but there's, there's, it is a team effort and Habitat recognizes that we're one small piece of the puzzle, but we certainly want to assist where we can. Yeah. Um, the things are funding dependent, it's partnership dependent, but we are doing our best to lay out, um, remove those as barriers to being able to provide um, services to community partners, community members. Okay. And there's a question, maybe talking about the voucher system for replacement furniture through the restores. You mentioned that at all? Um, so, and talking about, okay, all right, so the question, I don't know if everybody can see, are you interested in it's talking about yeah. okay, a voucher system for replacement of furnishings with restores with Habitat? Um, Julie, I'm not sure if you if you're if you're talking about how the resource themselves offering that or seeking assist financial assistance to support so that we can offer vouchers. Um, um, I, if I could talk for a second, I'm just thinking that um, we already do some partnering in the community. I'm in Kershaw County in Camden, and I work with CCM and some of the Christian Community Ministry people and help them with vouchers. 
Um, it's a small program, but uh, that's something that maybe we should think about on this scale where uh, some of the funding for folks that are needing items could come through restored. I mean, because we can certainly provide items, you know, with that funding at a much lower cost and they're, you know, very nice items. So it's not that they wouldn't necessarily be brand new, but they certainly would be high, you know, lightly used. Um, I would be interested in talking more about that. I think that's a great idea. And, and for, for folks to, to kind of understand what we're saying there is that so, so that voucher system would enable those individuals who've been impacted to come and, sh and essentially shop from the restore. Um, to, to her point, though, it is that's another area of funding of making sure that, again, we can support that. So I, I think that's a great that's a great point. I know there's been some conversations in other counties in the past week where this has been brought up and we've connected. I've gotten calls or emails and I've connected folks to our local restores. Um, so we can certainly look at what is a more coordinated effort. Um, regarding that and, and see if we can help fill that fill that gap. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I will uh, kind of maybe end in our last you know, 10 minutes and then certainly if anyone else has questions to just remind everyone, if you're new to this, this is a marathon. Uh, this is certainly not a sprint. Um, in our past disasters, I know the 1SC fund has been offering funding for anywhere from one and a half to two years post-disaster. That gives you an idea about how long some of this will take because it is a slower home at, one home at a time, right? Uh, so just kind of pace yourself, uh, give yourself a little bit of grace. Remember that not only have the people you worked with, but also some of your staff experience trauma. Uh, going through a disaster is, is, not a, um, is not what people typically have experience in. Um, and so really just being able to check in with yourself and with others and your clients to know that this is, a, this is an experience that, that um, most of us are not equipped for naturally. So, so really do take the time you need and, and, and recognize that we're here. It's a longer term process. Um, and we'll we'll support you in the best ways that we can. Anything else? Any other questions that anyone has for us before we head out? You're welcome to ask any questions. You can come off mute if it's a question that you think the, the, for the greater group that they would be able to benefit from. All right. Well, thank you all for joining us. Thank you very much to both Rand and Nancy for giving their time and for offering up this possible partnership. Uh, I hope we're all able to take advantage of it. And if you have any questions at all for any of us, you have some of our contact information. Uh, we welcome you to sort of reach out as needed. Thank you.